Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, let's just open with a word of prayer. Would someone be willing to pray for us before we begin? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time, my Master, that you have given us to learn your word. Lord, we pray that you will inspire us to learn whatever you have for, our master, for us, Master. Lord, I surrender all the students who are joined online and who are presently attending this course, Master, that you will give us your wisdom and understanding to know what you are teaching us, my master. And I also pray for our teacher who is teaching us and imparting to us what you have. Thank you, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Thank you. Uh, so we'll just uh, continue from where we stopped last week. Um, we stopped in the book of Romans. <clears throat> we'll continue from Romans 6. So we were just covering the outline here. Um, <clears throat> so uh, like we talked about, Romans uh, focuses a lot on uh, the uh, salvation through Jesus Christ, right? So one of the soteriological epistles. Uh, so from chapter 6 onwards, he's talking about sanctification in Christ. Uh, and um, he uh, first in chapter 6 talks about being dead to sin but alive in Christ so we cannot continue to sin. Uh, we are slaves to righteousness, not slaves to sin. So even though God's grace is available to us, uh, this doesn't give us an excuse uh, saying that we can sin and we will be forgiven. Uh, because we are sanctified by the Holy Spirit, uh, we no longer can continue to walk in sin. Um, <clears throat> chapter 7 uh, talks about this battle between us being spiritually renewed in, <clears throat> in our inner person and uh, the battle between our sinful nature and how um, that is a constant struggle. But our hope is uh, presented in Christ and uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit, which is what he moves on to in chapter 8. Um, and then uh, chapter, at the end of chapter 8, he talks about how uh, we can continue in our present sufferings in hope of that future glory. Um, so uh, chapter 8, verses 1 to 17, is encouraging us as believers not to live according to the flesh, uh, but to live according to the spirit. And um, the spirit uh, will empower us to walk in holiness. Uh, so the end of chapter 8, uh, talks about the intercession of the Holy Spirit for us uh, in order to accomplish all that God desires for us and God's desire for us is always good. Uh, with that, um, he goes on to chapter 9 where he's talking about Israel's rejection. Now, if you remember last week, we talked about the fact that uh, the church had become a primarily Gentile church because the Jews had been um, had been made to leave uh, Rome by Claudius, uh, but now with the return of Jews starting to return, there was that tension between uh, the Jews who were coming back and the Gentiles who had been in the church, and a clash of cultures and practices uh, that they had within the church. And so uh, again, here uh, Paul is talking about. Uh, how uh, in verses 9 to 10, he's talking about how Israel has been rejected, but only for uh, um, for a limited time. So he's, uh, he's saying that uh, their rejection is serving uh, for the salvation of the Gentiles it's because they have rejected uh, Jesus as their savior that now the Gentiles have this opportunity to receive uh, this uh, receive this hope that was theirs uh, for so many years, that was available to the Jews right from the Old Testament, something that was being talked about. 
so I just quoted uh, one verse here from chapter 10, verse 4. Christ is the culmination of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Uh, so we see in this one verse uh, that Jesus fulfills the Jewish law. Um, but that righteousness is offered to all who believe. So that is to Jew and Gentile alike. Anyone who believes uh, can receive uh, this righteousness that comes through Christ. Uh, with that, uh, he goes into uh, how should that righteousness be practically applied uh, in the lives of uh, the church. Um, so he begins chapter 12 uh, talking about our lives being a spiritual sacrifice uh, as a response to the mercy that we have received, right? So uh, he's telling the Gentiles, don't think that you are better than the Jews because uh, you have been saved and you have received the salvation. Uh, because the Jews have for so long been trying to earn their salvation by works. And this is why they have uh, not uh, received Jesus, right? This is why they have been rejected by God, because they're trying to earn their righteousness by works. So he's warning the Gentiles, likewise, don't forget that you've been saved by mercy and don't come to a place of boasting and thinking you are better than the Jews. Um, and so uh, he starts chapter 12 saying, in view of God's mercy. So recognize that this is God's mercy that has saved you. And uh, our response to God's mercy is to live a life of spiritual sacrifice. Uh, and how, what does that look like? What does that life of spiritual sacrifice look like? Um, he talks about uh, unity within the church uh, and within the community, so our larger community how we should relate to the church and to the larger community, how we should submit to the government in chapter 13, um, the kinds of relationships we should have with people uh, also in chapter 13. Uh, then in chapters 14 and 15, he's talking about in matters of opinion. So uh, here he's talking about um, disputes. This is uh, the the differences that are coming up between the Jews and the Gentiles, right? They have differences in what day is important, what should you eat, what should you not eat. And all of those things were becoming issues uh, that were um, kind of causing disruption in their relationships. So he's saying in all of these things, you follow uh, what seems right to you. Don't judge someone else's faith. Uh, I just uh, put one verse here, 15 verse 7, accept one another then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. So that's a summary of what he's saying in these chapters, uh, telling the Jews and Gentiles alike to accept one another uh, and not to uh, be caught up in these disputes over things that are not important, uh, over all of these ritualistic practices. Um, from here, he closes uh, with the last two chapters. So chapter 15, he uh, writes about his plan to visit uh, Rome and then from Rome uh, that they would help him to then go into Spain. Uh, so his uh, goal is to take the gospel to places that have not yet received the gospel. And so uh, since Rome already has a church, his goal is to go past Rome to Spain. Uh, and then in chapter 16, uh, he closes uh, with uh, greetings to various members of the church, uh, warning for them to uh, remain faithful uh, to Christ, and then a benediction uh, to close the letter. So with that, we come to the end of Romans. Uh, we're going to try and cover first and second Corinthians in today's class. So we might go a little fast. Um, also for second, uh, I've not included a few things from your textbook, things which I felt that are being covered in other parts that we are talking about in class. Uh, so please make sure you are also reading the notes because your exam will be based on your on everything in your textbook. Um, but I'm just covering um, some of the more key points that also hit on 
the other things that are in your textbook um, as well. So 1st Corinthians uh, is also one of the soteriological epistles. Um, so a comparison with Roman and Galatians. Roman and Galatians talk about justification by faith. Uh, but 1 Corinthians talks about being washed, sanctified, justified in the name of Jesus by the Holy Spirit. So it's talking about the uh, work of the Holy Spirit uh, in us. Um, so we know that Paul had already written a letter to the Corinthians, and he refers to this letter in chapter 5, verse 9. So although we call this 1 Corinthians because it's the first letter that we have in our Bible, there is a letter that Paul had written before this to the Corinthians. And that letter that he wrote to them uh, received a response. And so 1 Corinthians is a response to their response to his first letter. OK, um, so uh, for chapter 7, verse 1, he had uh, he had the church had written a response, and so he's writing this response to them. And uh, there were a few people from the church who had gone to visit Paul, Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus. And so um, they are the ones who take uh, a report of the church back to Paul and take that first response uh, from the church to Paul. And then Paul sends back his letter. Uh, with either these church members or with Titus, who goes back to the Corinthian church. And we'll read a little bit about that in 2 Corinthians, of Titus coming back from uh, the church in Corinth with a report from them. So uh, one thing is we don't have a copy of that first letter that went to the Corinthians, which is why it's also not in our scriptures. Uh, we only have references to it. So we know there was a letter that was sent out, but we don't know exactly what, were the, uh, what was the content of that letter. Uh, we know from 1 Corinthians itself that this letter was written by Paul. Uh, so right in the first verse, he mentions uh, that he is the one writing to them. And then in uh, the last chapter as well, he puts his own greeting in his own, in his own hand. So he um, says that he himself has written that. Um, date and location. So uh, this letter was written during Paul's second missionary journey. So uh, he spent 18 months in Corinth. And this is when the church was established. Uh, and after that, he moved on. He went to Ephesus. Uh, he stopped at Ephesus briefly, went on to Jerusalem, and then returned to Antioch. So that was the end of his second missionary journey. Uh, on his third missionary journey, he goes and he spends over two years in Ephesus. And this is where he writes 1 Corinthians from. So uh, the dating for this is somewhere between 53 to 55 or even 56 AD. Um, all of these dates are approximate because uh, we're just trying to uh, put dates to all the things that we know happened in Paul's journeys. Uh, so between 53 to 55 AD or 56 AD even is when he wrote it, more likely before 56 AD. Um, so yes, the church was established in his second missionary journey. And this letter is written in his third missionary journey when he was in Ephesus, while he was ministering in Ephesus. Um, so why did Paul write this letter? He had received reports, like we said, uh, from various sources. So there were the people who took that letter back to him. Uh, and then we see in uh, chapter 1, verse 11, he talks about some people from Chloe's household. So from this, uh, from this house church or from her house, her family itself, who had given him a report about what was going on in the church. And then he's also responding to the letter that the Corinthians had sent to him. Um, 
So one of the main issues that uh, we see addressed in First Corinthians is that the church had become very influenced by the culture around it. We will talk a little bit about the culture in Corinth itself. Uh, but uh, there was a huge focus on learning, on philosophy. There was uh, immorality that was being practiced in society. Um, there was a difference, a large uh, variance in status within society uh, because uh, Corinth was such a diverse city uh, that there were people who were very rich, but there were also the merchants, like even Paul, who was serving in the marketplace. Uh, would have been someone he would have been considered as someone of lower status because he was working uh, in in the marketplace he was working as a merchant um so there was a a wide variety of people from uh, different uh, economic backgrounds and so all of this uh, starts to then impact the people who are coming into the church right so the people in the church have this background of being from either a much lower status background or much richer people uh, some of them very learned uh, some of them um, highly proud of their uh, philosophical uh, influences and uh, something that was very uh, important in Corinthian culture. And so all of these uh, we see playing a part in the issues that had come into the church. Um, we The recipients are the church of God in Corinth, as we see in chapter 1, verse 2, uh, but also then to all God's holy people. So all those who call on the name of the Lord. So uh, meant to be a letter that would circulate among the churches as well, uh, the rest of the churches in the area. Uh, so the key verses we have from 1 Corinthians, if someone can read these verses for us, uh, 1 Corinthians 4, 5 and 1 Corinthians 14, 33. First Corinthians 4, 5, therefore judge nothing before the appointed time, wait until the Lord comes, he will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. First Corinthians 14, 33, for God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the congregations of the Lord's people. Thank you. So as we look at the outline, we'll see why these two verses are considered as key verses in 1 Corinthians. Um, we'll come back to them. Uh, so uh, one major theme in the epistle is order in the local church. That is, how is a church supposed to function uh, in a way that uh, is um, is reflective of who Christ is. So uh, unity uh, in the way we conduct our services, in the way people relate to each other, all of these things uh, are what Paul addresses in this letter. Uh, so just a note on the city of Corinth itself. So this is Corinth in the, um, in the ancient world, so a map of ancient Greece. Okay, we can see Corinth right here in, a little uh, piece of land that joined south, southern Greece to northern Greece. So it was a port city, which meant that there was a lot of ships coming in. There was a lot of trading coming in, uh, happening at Corinth. It was also at this key point in the center of Greece. And so it became uh, an important place connecting North and South Greek. Uh, it was considered as the capital of the province of Achaia, which is uh, the majority of ancient Greece. Um, at this point, uh, this is under Roman control, but it's still very uh, retained a lot of its Greek culture. Uh, and uh, so we see a lot of that uh, worship of gods and all of that still continuing in Corinth, uh, worship of Greek gods. Um, so Corinth was known for immorality, was known for sin, uh, was known to be a place of uh, where people would come who wanted to seek 
physical uh, pleasure or uh, just satisfying the flesh. It was that kind of place. It was a very important urban center. Uh, there were people coming in from all over. So lots of uh, different religions also that were present in Corinth. Uh, and the marketplace was a very important place in Corinth because all of the trading happened there. Uh, so that was a key place for Paul also to be ministering uh, in the marketplace. So uh, with that background on uh, the letter to the Corinthians, we'll just go a little bit into what the book actually talks about. Um, so it begins uh, with an introduction. And uh, what we see Paul say right at the start is that we as a church are called to be holy. So we know that this is something that he's going to address throughout the book. Uh, that call to holiness. Uh, and if we, uh, you were paying attention to what were the issues that he was addressing in the letter, it was that so much of the culture had influenced the church, right? That immorality uh, had come into the church. Uh, so much of uh, the other issues in culture had been brought into the church. And so he begins with this, that we are called to be holy. Um, and then he talks about the spiritual gifts. Uh, so the Corinthian church was a church that was really seeing the spiritual gifts being manifested uh, amongst its members. Uh, and so he commends them and he also says uh, that these gifts have been given and they will continue to be there uh, as you function as a church until the Lord's coming. So God has equipped you with these gifts uh, to continue uh, to be his body. Uh, till his return. Uh, then from here, he start, He addresses divisions in the church. Uh, we see this first major division is a division over leaders, uh, where people are fighting over the leader that they follow. Some say they follow Apollo, some say they follow Paul, some say they uh, follow uh, Cephas, Peter. And uh, so uh, why are they divided over leaders? Uh, it's because of that, um, the importance that the Corinthians placed on philosophy and uh, over that kind of uh, gift of speaking or so uh, of people being able to present their views in ways that were impressive, uh, use of rhetoric in their preaching. Uh, and so we know that Apollos was someone who was very gifted as a preacher. Uh, Paul, in comparison, uh, was not as uh, eloquent in his speech. And so there were some people who preferred Apollos over Paul. And then, like we talked about, uh, Paul was also uh, a tent maker, which was something that was of lower status. And um, a philosopher would not want uh, their leader to be someone who was uh, working with their hands. And so again, another reason for them to uh, reject Paul and to follow Apollos. So we see this kind of division in the church. And then Paul uh, addresses this division, uh, talking about certain uh, things about who God is. The first is that God, God's wisdom is not the wisdom of the world. So while these people were wanting their leaders to um, to meet the standards of the world in terms of wisdom. Uh, Paul says that God's wisdom is uh, far greater than the wisdom of this world. And the wisdom of this world is foolishness uh, in God's eyes. So God makes the wisdom of this world foolish. Um, and true wisdom, the true wisdom of God is understood only by those who have his Holy Spirit. Uh, it's those who have his spirit in them who are able to recognize uh, what is godly wisdom and what is natural uh, wisdom or what is worldly wisdom. Um, he then talks about the fact that all of God's servants are simply people who are carrying out the work that God has entrusted to them. So there is no um, there's no sense in boasting in the workers because they are simply carrying out their duty, but God is the one who's actually making the growth happen. 
so one, one waters, another uh, plants, another sows, uh, but God makes the plant grow. And so um, this is where our boasting should be, it should be in the Lord. And then his last uh, defense for um, why they should not be divided over leaders is that everyone's work will be judged when Christ returns. So what may look impressive now when Jesus returns will be tested. And only if it actually stands uh, God's test will it uh, be rewarded. But if it doesn't, if it burns up uh, under the fire of God's testing, uh, then it will prove that all that work that was done was actually done uh, with false motivation, was done uh, with um, with an intent that was not actually truly uh, godly intent. Uh, from there, he goes uh, into issues of um, moral or immorality within the church. Uh, he begins with an issue of sexual immorality in the church. So again, looking at how the church has been influenced by the culture, uh, right? And we see this, uh, the example of uh, the man who's sleeping with his father's wife, he uses that example and talks about the importance of judging sin within the church uh, so that we cannot ignore sin that is taking place within the church and we cannot take God's grace for granted. So uh, just tell the church, just because now you know that you are saved by grace, it doesn't mean that uh, you can turn a blind eye to sin. Uh, you need to address sin within the church and you need to get rid of this person. This person cannot continue to be in the church because that sin will spread within the church. Um, in chapter 6, he talks about uh, division between believers and people actually going to uh, courts of law against one another. Um, and here he says, why don't you let yourself be cheated? Uh, rather than taking your, uh, rather than being the one cheating others and then going to court against them. Uh, in all of these, we see a lot of talking about judgment. So it begins with Christ uh, being the judge. Then it talks about judge judging those within the church. Then here he talks about, don't you know that we are going to sit as judges with Christ? Uh, at his return, then how is it that you are going to outsiders to make judgments between you uh, within the church? Um, and then uh, in later on in chapter 6, uh, again, he goes back to sexual sin in the church and talks about uh, keeping our bodies pure because our bodies are the temple of God. Uh, in chapter 7, we see him responding to the letter that the Corinthians had sent to him. So he says, uh, with regard to the things you had mentioned in your letter, he uh, begins the chapter with that. And he talks specifically about marriage. So this whole chapter is about marriage, whether it's good to get married, whether it's better to stay single. Uh, his recommendation is that you focus uh, on serving God, and if um, if marriage is going to be a distraction, then it's better not to get married. Uh, and then he also encourages those who are married to unbelievers to continue to remain married. If that unbeliever wants to stay married to them, uh, to continue to stay married because uh, you might be the reason for them coming to salvation. Uh, now, this is not an instruction to say that you can marry an unbeliever. This is for people who were already married and then became believers, but their spouse did not become a believer. Uh, and so for them, he says, continue to stay in that marriage if your spouse still wants to stay married to you. Um, chapters 8 to 11, he starts to address some other things within the church. The first is uh, eating food sacrificed to idols. And he uses his own life as an example. He talks about how he has given up the right to receive support from the church, uh, although that is something that he can very well claim. Uh, he can take 
monetary support from the church for the work that he's done for the church, but he wants to do it for free uh, for the sake of the gospel. He wants to make that kind of sacrifice for the sake of the gospel. And so using his example of giving up his own rights, he encourages believers uh, to do what is beneficial for others in the body. Uh, so if he, he's uh, using that to say, do not eat food sacrificed to idols. Uh, do not do uh, things that will cause your uh, brother or sister in the Lord to fall. Uh, rather, give up your rights so that they may be protected, so that they may be blessed. Um, and then he uses examples from Israel's history uh, to talk about how Israel, although chosen, uh, a lot of them uh, fell away from the faith because of idol worship, sexual immorality, because they tested God, because they grumbled against God. And so he's warning the church to not fall into the same uh, trap that the Israelites fell into. Uh, chapters 11, verse 2 to 14, 40 uh, is where he addresses worship within the church and so here he begins with the head the issue of head covering uh, about modesty within the church and uh, acknowledging uh, that you are committed uh, a wife is committed to her husband and he is uh, the head uh, he is her spiritual head uh, he talks about the lord's supper and divisions that are happening in the church so we see that issue of status coming into their practice of the lord's supper where the poor are being forgotten and the rich are having a feast and uh, so he's calling them uh, back to recognize uh, the sanctity of the Lord's Supper and uh, telling them that this is what they're coming together for. Um, chapter 12, he talks about spiritual gifts and how they are to be exercised uh, or, and to recognize that everyone has a gift and it's all for the benefit of the body of Christ. Um, and all of the exercising of spiritual gifts is to be based on love, which he talks about in chapter 13. And then chapter 14, he talks about specifically prophecy and tongues as an example to say that gifts are to be used for the benefit of the whole body. And they should be exercised when the body comes together in worship. Uh, these gifts should be exercised in a way that uh, allows worship to happen in an orderly way so that there's no confusion. Um, Chapter 15, we go into resurrection. Uh, so he talks about the resurrected body. Uh, there were some people who were saying there is no resurrection. And so he is correcting them, uh, saying that if there is no resurrection, then uh, we of all people are to be pitied if our hope in Christ is only for this life. Uh, right? So our hope is an eternal hope. Uh, and that is why it's worth all the suffering that we are experiencing in this life, because we know that this is not all there is to our uh, to our life, but there is uh, the life that we will have with Christ uh, once we pass from this earth. And so he talks about that in chapter 15. And then in chapter 16, he uh, talks about the collection that is being made for the church in Jerusalem, uh, the money that they are collecting to give to the church in Jerusalem. Uh, he talks about his travel plans to come and visit them. Uh, and then he commends uh, certain people within the church, some of the leaders within the church, and then closes the letter uh, with some greetings. So that is all of first corinthians we covered that um quickly when we have a few minutes for second corinthians uh, but any questions or anything you want to share before we go on am i going too quickly too fast Okay, okay. So uh, we just because we have a lot of content, I'm just uh, trying to make sure we finish all of it before the end of the semester. So um, we'll go into Second Corinthians. Um, so this is Second Corinthians. So while First Corinthians 
in our Bible is actually Paul's second letter to the Corinthian church. Second Corinthians is Paul's fourth letter. Uh, so his first letter is the one that has been lost. His second letter is what we have in our scriptures as first, first Corinthians. Uh, the third letter is another one that we do not have a copy of, uh, but is referenced in 2 Corinthians. And this was a letter of discipline, uh, a letter uh, which was a little harsh uh, because of certain issues that were happening in the church that he needed to address. Uh, so how we know about this letter and that it was a letter of discipline is because of some things that he mentions in uh, Second Corinthians, so Second Second Corinthians two three to four and seven six to nine. Uh, if somebody can read that for us quickly, Second Corinthians two three to four and seven six to nine. Second Corinthians three to four, sister. Uh, chapter two verses three to four. Chapter two verses three. To four. Okay, I wrote, I wrote as I did. So that when I came, I would not be distressed by those who should have made me rejoice. I had confidence in all of you that you would all share my joy. For I wrote you out of great distress and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to grieve you, but to let you know the depth of my love for you. Thank you. And chapter 7, verses 6 to 9. Chapter 7. Verses 6 to nine. 9. But God who comforts the downcast comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort you had given him. He told us about your longing for me, your deep sorrow, your ardent concern for me, so that my joy was greater than ever. Even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but not only for a little while. Yet now I am happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance, for you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not armed in any way by us. Thank you, sister. So we see here um, Paul referencing this letter that he had written. Uh, and his main intent was to bring correction to the church. And uh, the church had responded uh, in godly sorrow. And so he was uh, very grateful uh, that their response had been um, one of repentance. Uh, so we see also what we had talked about earlier about Paul, that he was one who loved the people he ministered to, to the extent that he didn't mind uh, even saying things that would hurt them at that time if it meant that it would do good uh, eventually. And uh, we see that example here. So 2 Corinthians, uh, the date and location. So this was written uh, not too long after 1 Corinthians. We saw 1 Corinthians 53 to 55 AD. Uh, 2 Corinthians was 55 to 56 AD. So after Paul left from Ephesus, his third missionary journey, he goes from Ephesus to Macedonia, and this is the region of Macedonia. There are a few cities here, Neopolis, Philippi, Thessalonica, and uh, Berea. And it was while he was at Macedonia that he writes 2 Corinthians. Uh, so he says that Titus brought back a report to him about the church. This is what we just read. And um, Titus uh, takes back second corinthians to the church uh, and also goes back to make the final arrangements for uh, the money that is going to be taken to the church in jerusalem uh, we see that talked about in chapter 8 uh, in yeah, 6 16 to 17 and 23. So the purpose for writing uh, this letter, one was to assure them that uh, what he had, that his heart for them was one of love, that whatever correction he had sent uh, that had caused distress was for their good, uh, to also let them know that he was very glad to hear about their repentance, uh, to encourage them to continue uh, their collection for the church in Jerusalem, uh, 
because they had started the collection a year earlier. And so now he wants it all to be ready as he's going back to Jerusalem, that he would uh, the money there would be ready for him to pick up. Um, then he also uh, tells them that he will come visit them. And then one major part, uh, which is the last part of 2 Corinthians chapters 10 to 13, uh, he uh, has to defend himself against certain false teachers who have come into the church and who have begun to criticize him. So Paul himself established this church, right? But there were other leaders who came in after Paul left Corinth and who began to question Paul's apostleship and leadership and speak against him and boast about themselves. And so we'll see Paul addressing a lot of this in this letter, uh, just to make sure that the church is not led astray by these uh, false teachers who have come in. Uh, so a key verse here from 2 Corinthians, um, for what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord and ourselves as your servants for Christ's sake. So we see some key points here. We are preaching not ourselves uh, because the false teachers were boasting in themselves. Um, but Paul's uh, intent was very clear. It was to preach Christ and to be a servant to the people. And this was the evidence that he was a true minister of the gospel versus the teachers who had come in who were uh, using their preaching to boast about themselves, who were taking money from the people uh, who were speaking against Paul. So uh, all of these things are things that uh, Paul will differentiate himself and distinguish his ministry from these people in these ways based on what has been his uh, way of ministering to the church. Um, so we'll do a quick outline. We may go a little over time if you all are okay with that. Um, we'll try and finish uh, the outline if possible. Okay. Uh, so um, Paul begins the letter uh, with a greeting as usual. He talks about his suffering in Ephesus. So this uh, he was in Ephesus when he wrote First Corinthians. So he's talking about uh, what were the challenges he faced in Ephesus. Uh, he then talks about his change in plans. And this is where he says uh, all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ. So uh, he's saying that I, some people were questioning why Paul had not come to visit them when he had said that he would come to visit the church. Um, so he explains here why he changed his plans. His plans were changed because he didn't want to cause them any more distress. He had written that letter to them. Uh, he knew that they had been hurt and he didn't want to go to them at that point of time uh, and cause more distress. And so he decided not to visit the church, uh, but rather uh, to go into other parts and minister in other places. Um, and then uh, in verses 5 to 11, he talks about uh, someone who had uh, caused a huge offense to Paul and to the church. Uh, and so uh, they had brought correction to this person. And so Paul says, bring this person back now so that they will not fall away from the faith. Uh, and Satan won't use this as a way to take them away from uh, the body of Christ. Uh, we then see Paul talking about his ministry, uh, beginning with talking about he and uh, those who serve with him being as taken as uh, slaves of Christ. And as slaves of Christ, they carry the fragrance of Christ wherever they go. Uh, but that fragrance is received differently based on the people who, um, who see them. If it's someone who actually is receiving the gospel, it is a sweet fragrance. But someone to someone who rejects the gospel, it's a fragrance of death that they bring, uh, that they carry. Um, he then talks about his calling from God, that the church itself is his letter of recommendation, that the work of the Spirit in the church testifies to the fact that, the, that what Paul has done has been a true work of the Holy Spirit. Um, and he talks about the glory of his message, which is the glory of the new covenant versus the old covenant uh, that Moses 
uh, brought in. Uh, this covenant is so much greater, and Paul has the privilege of uh, bringing that gospel to the people. Um, Paul also talks about his suffering. Uh, if we can just quickly read 1 Corinthians 4 5, someone can read that. 2 Corinthians 4 5, sorry. I think we actually read that in the key verse. Um, yeah, 2 Corinthians 4, 5, sorry. So it's here. For we preach not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, uh, and ourselves for your servants. So this is his, the evidence that the ministry is doing is one of sincerity, uh, that it's purely for the glory of Christ and to serve the church. Um, he then uh, goes on uh, to talk about uh, this ministry of reconciliation. So we have been entrusted as carriers of the gospel to reconcile people back to God. And uh, so this is what we do. And we're willing to do it even at the cost of our own lives, at the cost of our own um, our own physical safety. All of the suffering, all of that is worth it because we're bringing people back to God. Uh, so his evidence of... Uh, the fact that his ministry is something uh, that is really trustworthy is in the way he has done his ministry. Uh, and uh, so now he comes into this thing of calling the exhortation to holiness is to say, do not be yoked with unbelievers. So who are these unbelievers? These are the false teachers who have come into the church who are telling them things about Paul uh, and uh, about the other leaders with Paul, Titus and Timothy and uh, others who had served, with, uh, served the church with Paul uh, and drawing them away. And so he's saying, don't, uh, don't entertain these people. Don't be yoked with them um, because uh, you yourself will uh, go astray if you do that. Um, and then he uh, talks about their repentance in response to the letter that he had already sent. Uh, then we go into the section on giving. So all of this is related to uh, the giving to the church in Jerusalem. Uh, he encourages them to finish collecting the money they had started to collect. Uh, he encourages them to give as much as they can give, but not to give more uh, than they, they are able to give. Uh, he talks about practical uh, aspects of how the money is going to be collected, who's going to take it. And then he closes with the benefits of giving uh, that uh, that will be a blessing to the church. And uh, those who are blessed will in turn bless the church uh, as well. And then uh, chapters 10 to 13 uh, is where he uh, closes with the defense of his apostleship, uh, so talking about his power in Christ. They do not fight uh, the battles uh, as people of the flesh fight, uh, but they fight with spiritual weapons. So uh, this is in contrast to the false apostles. Um, in this chapter 11 to 12, that he talks about his suffering that proves uh, that he is serving uh, serving with right intentions that he is he's giving up all of these his own physical comforts he suffered so greatly for the sake of the gospel and that is proof of the fact that his ministry is one that is sincere and is not meant to deceive or, or to blind uh, the church um, but is one that is truly for their benefit um, and then he uh, closes uh, with um, he talks about his plans uh, for travel, uh, closes with certain exhortations, and then a benediction, uh, which is the usual way he closes the letter. So in chapter 12 is where he also talks about the, his vision and the thorn in his flesh and uh, talks about the fact that these apostles, he's contrasting himself with these apostles. I'll just close with this, that they are boasting in themselves, but he boasts in his weakness so that the glory of God will be seen all the more in his life. And so um, 
in Paul's defense of himself, although he talks about the things he has suffered, the sacrifices he has made, his final conclusion is that his boasting is in his own weakness uh, because in his weakness, Christ is glorified. Uh, and um, that is um, that is the last closing bit of his defense as uh, one who can be trusted, one whose ministry can be trusted. Uh, so with that, we come to the end of 2 Corinthians. Um, uh, please do go back and read your notes as well. Uh, so we will try and cover maybe two episodes with each class. And um, I hope that we can all stay together. If it's too much and too fast, uh, please let me know. OK. Thank you all for being here. I'll see you all on Thursday. Thank you, sister. Thank you. Thank you, sister. Thank you.